Are you ready? Yeah, yeah some of you are good. All right, Jesus Christ, God's greatest gift. <clears throat> God gave himself the greatest gift you and I could ever have. All right. Don't, don't tell me. <laughs> Jesus means Savior. He's the Savior of the world. Christ means anointed one. In Hebrew, it's the word Messiah. In Greek, it's the word Christos or Christ. And it means really God in a sense, the anointed one of God. So Jesus is both God. He's fully God and he's fully man. That's something that, that, that is, is very important because only a person could save us who was fully God without sin and who was fully man, who, who was a man just like the rest of us and, and the men and man is the, is the one who committed the first sin. So we needed a man to, 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 to pay the sacrifice, but no man was worthy. And so God sent his son, Jesus Christ. He's the only one who saves us to the utmost. He's not a good gift. He's the greatest gift. God offers the best of everything and your relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no other name, the Bible says, under heaven like the name of Jesus. Jesus the Christ. I want to read to you a little article about this name Jesus. Jesus, it's a little name. It's a small word. Say this little name in public, however, in a way other than an obscenity and stand back and watch the fireworks. This little name is like a tiny detonator that trigger, triggers a nuclear warhead. You can say God and you won't get a squeak. You can say our father or our mother in heaven and few will flinch. You can say great spirit and people will nod in approval. You can say Allah and you will be deemed tolerant. But say Jesus and just wait for the sonic boom. Articles will appear in the paper Reprimands will be posted in the home office. Suits will be threatened by the civil liberties block. So don't say Jesus. Jesus is divisive. And now is a time for unity. Jesus is an extremist. And that must mean right wing. Jesus is exclusive. So his name amounts to hate speech. Keep his name to yourself. Cloister it in your church. Lock it in your prayer closet. Close it between the covers of your Bible. But for God's sake, don't voice it in the public square. It's immodest. It's immoral. It's unloving. There's only one problem with that statement. Jesus is God. Only one problem. Jesus alone brings salvation. Only one problem, all other gods are nothing. So speak his name aloud, shout it from the rooftops, whisper it in the dark, write it in the sky. That's not hate, folks, that's hope. Praise God. Many people say that Christianity is exclusive because it says that Jesus is the only way to the Father. And so it excludes other people. But no, it says there's one way because there is only one way, but everybody is invited to come that one way. So that makes it the most inclusive faith in all of history of mankind. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now that's pretty inclusive. Everybody is invited. The reason I think people really get upset with Jesus is because that he is alive. He is God, and people start talking to him like he's real. And they say, you need some Jesus. And people get upset because they think they are all they need. Jesus Christ, the greatest gift that mankind, humankind has ever known. Jesus is not just a good gift. He's the best gift. And what do I mean when I say gift? What do I mean when I say the best? Well, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. That's a gift. You don't earn it. You don't merit it. You can't work it up within you. When we pray for the Spirit to come here on Sunday morning, y'all can get down and go, I want some Spirit. Give me some Spirit. Oh, I'm going to dance. I'm going to jump. I'm going to raise my hands. I'm going to give me some. That's not how you get the Spirit. You get the Spirit by just opening up your heart 
You don't have to say a word and say, God, I want what you want. Your will be done in my life. You don't have to speak a word. You just get down with God and you say, give me what you want. And it's free. And God will give it to you. Just don't restrain. Don't hold him back. Don't quench the spirit. Don't throw water on it. Man, if you start feeling a little tingle in your heart this morning, just open it up, man. Just, just receive all you can from God. Don't hold back. It's a free gift for God. So love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's free and it's life and it's abundant and it's everlasting. Folks, that's why God is the best gift or why Jesus Christ. With, with, the, with, with the creation, God made everything good. And then, and then the fall came and the good got distorted but when Jesus came, he made everything that was good great. I mean, Jesus came and gave us the message of the gospel that we can be saved by faith in him and that he died on the cross for our sins and I don't have to live in condemnation or, or guilt because he has set me free. He loves me. I have become a child of God. He makes everything come alive. Let me tell you, this sermon this morning is about Jesus. If you don't get anything else out about it, we're talking about Jesus. He's the greatest gift you or I will ever have. And you've just got to acknowledge it. When you start acknowledging it, when you start worshiping him and talk, calling him the greatest gift, that's when you get the blessing of God. Hebrews chapter 1 talks to us about how the Old Testament was sort of the foreshadowing of Jesus. The Old Testament was good, and it was the law that God gave us, and it was the prophets that God gave us, but it was all uh, predicated upon Jesus Christ coming. It, it was all foreshadowing. It was all telling about the prophesying about the coming of the Savior who would make not just things good, but he would make things great. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 begins, God, who at various times and various ways spoke in times past, to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Just stop a minute and wrap your head around that. God has spoken to us by his son. Jesus came. He was God. He created the heavens and the earth. He, he came and he gave us an example of who God is. And he, he spoke to us and he revealed God to us. Whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. The kingdom of God is going to be turned over to Jesus one day when he was, and he is going to rule, the Bible says, for a thousand years. John 1, 2 through 4 says, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. <laughs> in him was life, and that life was the light of men. You know, I've been reading a book lately about it takes more faith to, to, to believe to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian or a believer in God. And that is so true. As I'm reading this book, it's talking about the creation. And it's talking about scientists have now come to the understanding that before the Big Bang, before the beginning, and remember that the Bible says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, and at the beginning of the last century, scientists said there was no beginning. That the world, the universe had always been here. It had been existent eternally. And they just staked their credentials. They staked their reputations on that. And then they began to discover when they got better scientific equipment, hey, there was a beginning. And many of them tried to refute that because they knew if there was a beginning, then there had to be a lineup and an alignment with the Bible. Because the Bible said in the beginning, so many of them, even Albert Einstein himself, tried to figure out ways to make it not so. There can't be a beginning because if there is a beginning, there is a God. You know what I was reading the other day? It says before the beginning, before it all came into existence, there was no such thing as space, time, or matter. And the Bible says he made it all out of nothing. <laughs> there wasn't even time. And the Bible says before time began, Jesus loved you. The Bible tells us 
Before time began, there was a time when there was no time. And even scientists today tell us there was a time when there was no time. But yet then they can't believe in Jesus. You know why they can't believe in Jesus? It's because their flesh won't let them. It's because they don't want to humble themselves. And I do not speak lowly of these people. We, we need to love these people just as Jesus loved them. Jesus died on the cross for everybody. It's the most inclusive act that was ever created in the history of, of human, humankind. And he's, a, he's an heir. He's going to be the heir of all things. And guess what, folks? If you believe in Jesus, the Bible says we're going to be joint heirs with Jesus. We're going to rule and reign with him. I don't know what in the world all that means, but I know one thing. It means I'm not going to have to worry. I'm not going to have to doubt. I'm not going to have to fear. I'm, not, you know, <laughs> I'm going to rule and reign with Jesus. And you are too. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're going to rule and reign with Jesus. Y'all need to get excited about that. Need to be, woo! Thank you, Jesus. All right. <laughs> Go, Roger. <laughs> I'll, talk, I'll talk to your wife Monday. That's good. <laughs> Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, the brightness of the Father's glory, and the express image of his Son, and beholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. There's no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. I'm telling you the truth. That little thing I just read to you is the truth. You go in a place, to, to a common place, and you start talking about Jesus like he's real. Start talking about my Jesus and you see what happens. You can talk about Muhammad. You can talk about Buddha. You can talk about anybody you want to. The, the great man upstairs, the big boy, the, people, people will pretty much go with you. But you start talking about what is it about that name? There, there are guys in baseball named Jesus. It's not a problem. You know, they're named Jesus too. What is it when you talk about Jesus like he's the son of God? I tell you, it makes people, it's, it's, it's something in that name. The Bible says there's some, there are miracles that are wrought in that name. Lives are saved in that name. Lives are transformed in the name of Jesus. All authority and power has been given to him, and he has purged us from all our sins so that if we would just believe in him, the Bible says we can have eternal life. We can come to the Father. The, 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 the mystery of mysteries is revealed in Jesus Christ. Did you get that? What do you need in this life? All you need in this life is Jesus. He is everything you will ever need. You say, wait a minute now, I need some food, and I need some raiment, and some clothing, and I need a house. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Don't worry. You know, I want to get that faith. I'm like that man we were talking about last week. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I want to get to where I'm just like Jesus. It doesn't matter whether I have a place to lay my head or to hang my coat. Jesus is all I need. He will provide for my needs if I'm seeking to love him and follow him and, and, and make him the Lord of my life. He's a real. He's real. He's alive. But listen, you got to know him. You got to love him. And the only way you do that is just to ask him. You just trust him. You just believe in him. You can just start talking to him. Listen, if Jesus is not alive, if Jesus is not real, if he's not the son of God, it's because you're not in love and in awe of him. Boy, when you receive him, he's knocking. The Bible says he knocks on your heart's door. He desires that every person be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So God is working in your life whether you want to admit it or not. So just open up and let him come in. You've got a decision to make. Either Jesus is worth investing your life, your whole life in, or he's not. That's it. You can't, you can't put one foot in Jesus and one foot in the world, one foot in yourself and one foot in Jesus. Man, you have got to jump in with both feet into Jesus. You just got to let him take control. And, and we have all kinds of questions when we do that. Well, I won't be good enough and I won't measure up and I don't know if I can follow him faithfully to the end. He says, you jump in and trust me and hang on, buddy, because I'm going to give you the ride of your life. 
I'm not going to make it perfect. Man, you're going to have some hills. You're going to have some valleys. You're going to have all kinds of issues in your life. But you just keep hanging on to me. Keep trusting in me. And I will work everything together for good for those who love me and those who are called according to my purpose. C.S. Lewis, who was a brilliant man, far more smarter than I am, said, either this man, Jesus, was and is the Son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can't take the Jesus of the Bible and make him into just a great prophet or a great teacher or some moral person. Man, he claimed to be God. So he was either crazy or a madman or or just not a a truth teller. He was a liar or he was what he said he was. C.S. Lewis goes on and says, Christianity seems seems to be about morality and rules and guilt and virtue. See, that, that's wrong. That's, that's what we make it all about. Now, if you are a Christian, you will behave. You will be moral. But we make it all about these rules sometimes. But Chris, Christianity, C.S. Lewis says, seems to be about morality, rules, guilt, and virtue. Yet it leads out of that into something beyond. Because when you start thinking about all the rules, all the virtue that's required to be like Jesus, you realize you can't do it. And it leaves you on to the next thing that God wants to lead us on to. We need a Savior. We need Jesus. We need a Lord. It leads us to Jesus who is the greatest gift that God has ever given us. As I said just now, it's the difference between living in the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Man, where do you want to live? The problem with Adam and Eve was they lived in the tree of life. They had life. They had it abundantly. And maybe they were a little naive. Who knows? But they wanted to find out about good and evil. So they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then they found out, I don't have life anymore. They found out that they had sinned. And they fell short of the glory of God. And so they fell out of the life. And the way for you and me to get restored is, 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 to, is to go to the tree of life. It's to go to Jesus and live the life. A lot of people say, how do you do that? I'm telling you, you just, it's simple. You just ask Jesus in. You just take his word and you believe it. You believe John 3, 16. You just believe it. You just trust him. You stand up and you tell somebody about it too because if you don't tell them, then you don't believe it in your own heart. You say, if the whole world wants to call me a fool, so let it be. I'm standing for Jesus. I'm believing in Jesus. Yes, I'm going to fall. I'm going to fail. I'm going to come up short. But guess what? His blood cleansed all my sins, past, present, and future, and I'm just trusting in him. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. Jesus constantly proclaimed himself to be God. Watch out this Easter. Watch out. It's coming. Get ready, they're going to be on TV, professors and PhDs and DWDMs and everybody else, and they're going to be telling, oh, it ain't so, it ain't so, we found the grave, there's something in there, but it's all a bunch of bunk. It's stuff that's been circulating for centuries, they didn't find it out last week. It's the denial of Jesus Christ, it goes all the way back to the garden when, when the serpent told Eve, oh, did God really say, believe me. You believe him, friend, you're going to believe the lie. Some people say Jesus never meant to be God. He never said it. He didn't teach it. Let me tell you, if Jesus is not God, we might as well get up and go down to the bar and take a drink. I want y'all to go tell everybody today the preacher told you to go to the bar and take a drink. I just said if we don't believe Jesus is God, it's all a hoax. It's not worth anything. Jesus can't save us. God has to save us. Listen, I don't care what they tell you this, this Easter about Jesus not being God and not claiming to be God. Listen to what the Bible says. John 10, 38. Though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I and in him. The Father and I are one. He says, if you can't believe me, he's talking to the people who were around him at the time, believe my works. People came to him and said, nobody can do what you're doing unless they were God. Nobody can walk on water. Nobody can feed 5,000 out of a few fishes and a few loaves. 5,000 plus women and children. Nobody can, can, 
can raise the dead to life. No man can heal somebody who's been lame 40 years and he springs up and though his legs should be atrophied and, and he shouldn't be, he, he should be like butter. He stands up and leaps and praises God. Nobody can do that. Only God can do that. He was constantly calling himself God. You call me teacher and Lord and I say to you, well done for so am I. So I am. That word I am, we don't pick it up so much here in our modern day with English. But in, in, in the Hebrew language or the, or the uh, I, can't remember, I can't remember the name, Aramaic language that, that he was probably speaking in, this I am is the word for Jehovah, for God Almighty. When Moses was, re- when, when, when Jehovah, when God revealed himself, Jehovah revealed himself to, to Moses at the burning bush, he says, tell him I am is I am, that's the name for God, I am. Because I am, you are. And if I, if I am not, you are not. He's the substance of everything. He holds the world together. In him, it consists. And so when Jesus says, I am, why else did those rabbis and, and, and Pharisees want to stick up, pick up rocks and stone him to death over making a statement like that? Because they knew what he was claiming. He was claiming to be God. And then he said in John 8, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. You know, that's not good English, folks. You should say, before Abraham was, I was. Uh Uh-uh. Not if you're always. If you're always in your eternal, you don't say, I was. You are. There's no beginning. There's no end. You know, it's always. And that's what Jesus is saying. I am. Jesus was God. He was fully God. He was fully man. Colossians 2.9 says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus, all of God is wrapped up in a body. He was fully God. NIV puts it this way, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Only man and God could save us. John 14, 6. This isn't John 14, 6, but it leads to us. Jesus took our sins and he gave us his life. He died in our place. In in all the religions of the world, it says you have to do. You have to do something. In all the religions of the world, you have to do. But in Christianity alone, in Christ alone, it says it's done. You can't do. He did it for you because he loves you. You might be saying this morning, I don't feel it. Number one, don't go on your feelings. Put your faith first. And number two, believe it no matter what. Hang on to it. Satan wants to accuse you. Satan wants to rob you of your riches of the kingdom. Don't let him do it. Trust in the Lord. There are thousands of reasons. If you and I sat down today, we could go over that that would make us believe in God. And realize that there is a God in heaven and earth. So don't let Satan lie to you. Satan wants to tell you there is no God. What did Jesus mean by he took our sins and he gave us his life? John 14, 6, Jesus says he's the big W. He's not George Washington, the big W. He's not George W. Bush, the big W. He is is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. That's what He means. It's not exclusive in its invitation. Oh, it's exclusive that there's only one way. Now, you're not going to follow Buddha and get to heaven. You're not going to follow Buddha and get to the truth. You can hum and sit on a, a statue all your life and hum and, and go to the top of the mountain and, and you can shout mantras and you can, you can meditate and you can try to lose yourself, but you are not coming to the truth. And you're definitely not coming to the life. Jesus is saying, I'm the only way, and, and that is exclusive. There's only one way. But it's an invitation. It's very inclusive. Everybody's included in the whole world. Jesus died for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Life eternal. The truth. Oh, man, I'm telling you. 
I don't know it all. As Paul says, I haven't apprehended yet. I ain't got there yet. I won't get there till the day I see him face to face and I dwell totally unobscured upon the truth and I don't have to see through a mirror dimly or darkly anymore. I'll see it then and I'll be bathed in the light of God. But that's going to happen one day. But I'm going to tell you, since I came to know Jesus, I know more truth than I've ever known in my life. I'm even wiser than I've ever been in my life. That doesn't mean I have arrived or I'm the wisest person in the bunch here today, but I'm telling you, Jesus gave me some wisdom just by coming into my life, just by inviting him in. This passage, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, is so inclusive that that there's a story in John. John chapter 4 about a woman, a Samaritan woman, who goes to a well. And Jesus tells her he wants to give her some living water. Jesus alone, Jesus alone can give us the living water, nobody else that springs up into eternal life. This woman had possibly lost all hope when she comes to that well. She comes and she's got three against her. She's an immoral woman. She's a Samaritan and the Jews don't like the Samaritans. They're half-breeds. They're a mixed race. They're a mixed lot, a mixed bunch. They have a mixed religion. And she's a woman. Jesus' own disciples come up. They've been away into town and come up seeing Jesus conversing with this woman. They say, what in the world are you doing, Jesus? Have you lost your mind? You're talking to a woman. She's a Samaritan, and you can see she's a woman of ill repute. And you're talking to her. That's who Jesus came for. And that woman comes out there to the well, and she has nothing. She, She has something to draw the water with, and Jesus has nothing. And Jesus says, give me a drink. And she says, why would you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, to give you a drink? You would think I have polluted the water if I'd bring the drink up. Jesus didn't go into all that. He says, man, you don't. if you knew who you were talking to, if you knew who you were talking to, You would ask me for a drink, and I'd give you a drink that that your thirst will be quenched forever. And she said, Lord, give me this water. I want it. I want some of that living water. He tells the woman, whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. At first, she thinks he's talking about like a fountain. That you can just pour, put on the tap. You know how blessed we are to live in this country. Just turn the water. They were over in India trying to get water purified and dig wells and everything else. People don't have it around this world. Historically, they haven't had it. Man, we've got so much. Man, if, thank God for what. When you sit down and bow your head at the meal today, thank God for your water. Oh, so much to be thankful for. God has blessed this nation. Oh, man, come on Sunday nights. God has blessed this nation because a few people in this nation decided that we need to build a nation based on God and his word. And God blessed that. And as we're moving away from God and his word, God's going to bring destruction and a curse on this country. And he's given us several wake-up calls. I, for one, believe 9-11 was a wake-up call. And there are a lot of other calls going off. We're not the strongest nation or becoming not the strongest nation in the world. Do you want the living water? Do you want to be spiritually filled? I'm telling you, just believe, just trust him. Don't let Satan accuse you. Don't doubt. A man who is doubting is like a wave tossed by the sea. Put your faith in Jesus. Don't wimp out. God will deliver you. God will save you. God will fill you. God. God, Jesus is everything you need. He's all we need. Simple message, simple message. You know, Jesus is just a hell escaper for some people. You're not going to know the the joy of the Lord when all you're looking for is a ticket to heaven and you want to live your life any way you want to and you don't want to come under the power of Christ. Don't let the enemy defeat you. Listen. There's no condemnation. There's no guilty verdict now for those who are in Christ Jesus. You have been pardoned. You have been cleansed if you believe in Jesus. You're not going any time in your life, if you ask Jesus into your life right now, and and, and you believe it, and you mean it, and, 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 and God has come into your life, and he's transformed you, and you know it, you think differently. You don't think like you used to. You don't want to do the things you used to do. God begins to change you. He doesn't do it all at once. That man, that, 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 would, that would drive us crazy. He does it gradually. He just deals with us. He, he, he knows he, he couldn't expose all our sin to us at once, so we'd go crazy. We'd flip out. 
And so he just does it gradually. But as he does it, you're transformed. The Bible says, we're going to read that in just a minute. I get ahead of myself. But we're going to be transformed from one stage of glory to the next. God takes it slow with us sometimes. <laughs> but he does it. And there's no, kind of, there's no day going to come when, when you're going to say, oh, no, the trial's coming. Oh, no, I don't know what I'm going to do. No, if you're a Christian, you're saved. There is no condemnation. Let's look at that verse in, in Romans 8, chapter 1. There is therefore now no condemnation, no guilty verdict to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Stop trying to measure up and look up. You'll never measure up. I want to be holy as Christ is holy, but I'll never make it. But I keep wanting to make it. And you know, even though I fail miserably at times, I know this. God will forgive me, and he will forgive me, and he will forgive me as long as my heart is sincere. Now, there's some things if I keep doing, and God knows I better quit, and he's given me enough chance, he's, he's going to give some punishment down on me. <laughs> he's going to bring some issues in my life. He's going to cause some problems in my life. He wants me to wake up. He wants me to get closer to him. He wants me to be holy. That's where the happiness is. That's where the joy is when, when we seek to be like him. We sung songs this morning about Jesus. I don't know about you. I, I said this the other week. Sometimes I have a problem concentrating on the words. I'm into the tune or the beat, you know. And, you know, I got a little soul in me. And, 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 I, and I get into that and I'm not concentrating. I'm not worshiping. You know. <laughs> oh, man. Or, Here's the, here's, here's the clincher. Do you sing songs to Jesus during the week? Or do you just do it when you come in here on Sunday? I'm not telling you to go out in public if you can't sing. Start singing. But, <laughs> hey, that's all right, too. The Bible says you don't have to sing. It just says make a joyful noise. Listen, if you had not gotten there yet, just keep looking to Jesus. And you will be transformed the Bible says, into his image. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, what you got to do is just deny yourself and say, Jesus, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not good looking enough. I don't even have a good enough voice you got to do it through me. I want, you to, I want you to feel me. I want you to do it through me. I'm telling you, these, these are not just words that float out into space somewhere. Th this is real. It's true if, if you really ask Jesus. And listen, when you ask Jesus and you say, I'm crucified, then you got to be crucified. You can't say, oh, well, I want to keep doing this, God. And God, I know this goes against your word, but hey, I want to keep fooling around with it. Some. No, when God reveals something to you and convicts you of it, you've got to get rid of it. And let me tell you, you can get rid of it. Because he will give you the power to do it. All, he says in 2 Corinthians 3, with we, with all, with unveiled face. It's like... We, as we look into the Bible, as we look to Jesus, as we pray to him, he will begin to reveal himself to Him, to us. And we will be like an unveiled face and, and the fullness of God's glory will shine upon us. We all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image, into his image, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm getting transformed. A guy named uh, Chuck Swindoll, Charles Swindoll, wrote a book several years ago, Three Steps Forward and Two Steps Back. That sort of sums up most of our lives. We want to follow God, and so we take three steps forward, and then we fail two steps back. But then we take three steps forward, and then we take two steps back. And then we take three steps forward. And then we take two steps back. Guess what we're doing? We're moving forward. We're being transformed into his glory. You know, and you do that. How? By getting smarter, by getting stronger, by saying, I'm going to read my Bible 50 times a day. No, I'm going to do works. I'm going to do rituals. No, by holding Jesus. Just getting to know him. He's alive, folks. His spirit is alive. We just want our spirit sometimes to take over. That's why we don't experience him. God's laws are a constant reminder that you need a savior. 
You know, we, we, we get into this Christian thing and we start thinking, well, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do that, I got to obey all his laws, I got to obey all his commandments. Listen, God gave us the laws for two reasons. One, that we would be different from other people, that, that we would be holier, that we would be more moral, that, that we would seek to be like him. But he also gave us all his laws so that we would realize we need him. Because I can't make it on my own. I can't change on my own. I can't transform myself on my own. I can wish it. I can want it. I can desire it of my own abilities and my own flesh. It will never happen. I need Jesus. Only in Christ Jesus can, can I have no condemnation and can I realize that, 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 that salvation is a free gift and I don't have to worry about it. I'm just... I'm telling you, I've told you this a hundred times. When I get to heaven, and I don't believe this is going to happen, but if St. Peter is standing there at the gate and says, what are you doing here? I'm not going to say, well, I help little old ladies across the street. I tithe 10% in church. Actually, I tithe 15, 20% in church. I did this, I did that, I did the other. I'm going to say, Jesus! <laughs> He's the key. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Listen, Jesus says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Go home today and read Matthew 5 through 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount. It's one of Jesus' longest teachings that we have recorded in the Bible. And you will read that and you will realize there is no way, Jose, I could ever make myself get into heaven by my works. He says, if, if you never murdered anybody, if you thought about it, if you were angry with somebody just as much, if you just never committed adultery, if you thought about it, if you, if you lusted after it, if you wanted it in your heart, you committed it. If you call your brother a fool, you've sinned, you fall short. You can't make it on your own. That's what the law tells us. And he came to fulfill the law. All those old things and the, uh, all the sacrifices in the Old Testament, we say we don't have to do them anymore, and we don't. But there still has to be a sacrifice made. That didn't nullify that. Jesus came and died for us. He paid the price. He is the sacrifice. He's everything I need. And so I don't need anything else. I don't have to go out and slaughter goats and cattle today because Jesus died for me. Amen. Doesn't that, isn't that a great gift? I am glad we're not slaughtering cattle and, and, and goats and sheep in here today and turtle doves. I mean, man, that would consume all your time, wouldn't it? <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus came and did it for us. He came to fulfill the law so that we realize that we need him more than ever. Only one person is qualified to give you eternal life, and that's Jesus Christ. He's not just a good gift. He's the greatest gift. Romans 6 says, by now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Eternal life begins here and now. You know, what I'm telling you today, I'm sitting up here saying, I have told you this and told you this and I've told somebody this a whole lot all during my life, but it's still true and the world needs to hear it. And we need to take this out and tell other people. Eternal life begins here and now, not later on. Or we're going to realize it fully in, in the life to come. And from here on out, we're supposed to be disciple makers. We're supposed to tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and we fail so miserably. You know why? I, I just don't think we realize Jesus is the greatest gift. Derwin Gray is, is, a, is a former NFL football player. He's a pastor of a church in Charlotte, a multicultural church in, in Charlotte that's just growing out of the seams, and he just loves God with all his heart. And, and he was talking the other week about, about, uh, about why we don't tell others about Jesus. He says, and we have to take classes to learn how to tell others about Jesus. He says, I never had to take a class to go out and tell people how good my wife was. Why? Because I love my wife. Because I think she's the greatest gift that ever was given to me. So I go out and tell the world about my wife. I tell you, I got a good wife. I told her not to cook grits this morning for the men. Guess what she did? She cooked grits. <laughs> she got up right with me and, and she cooked grits. You know, because she, she wants to serve God. She wants to serve people. And I got a great wife. But let me tell you, I got a great Savior. His name is Jesus, and I don't need to be ashamed of him. I need to tell the world, God, give me the boldness to witness for him and live my life in such a way that others see Jesus in me. 
If you could do something great for God by his power, what would it be? We're going to close with this this morning. I think some of us think we're incapable. Listen, he gives you and me the promise of the Holy Spirit. We just talked about that with the living water. We talked about the fact that he saves, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, that there's no condemnation, that he's all that you and I need. He says in John 14, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. And greater works than these he will do. Because I go to the Father and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. You know what? I think sometimes we don't believe that verse. Because we're not in love with Jesus. Because we don't believe he's the greatest thing that ever happened to us. I'm telling you, when you get so full of Jesus, you cannot hold it in. It's going to come out. God's going to start doing things in your life as you seek him and you love him with all your heart. Let us pray. Lord God, I just thank you for your word. It's what keeps me going. If I didn't have your word, Lord, I'd be a miserable wretch. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins. I, I believe. I trust you. Help my unbelief. I want to become more like you. I want to be transformed into your image, Lord. But I know what that means. It means I've got to surrender my will. I've got to give up the desires of my flesh. And I've got to want what the Spirit wants. Lord, I've got to quit excusing the flesh. And, you know, the Spirit wants it, but the flesh doesn't. I've got to realize the Spirit, your Spirit is stronger than my flesh and greater things than even you did I will do we will do father if we just believe we can ask anything in your name not not for our wishes not for our wants not to make me more comfortable but lord to further your name and to glorify your name and to bring honor to you if i can if, if that's my desire if my desire is to love you with all my heart you tell me i can ask anything in your name and it will happen i can ask for people to be saved and you'll save them because you desire that all people be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. And if I will pray according to your will, you will do what you say. Father, I've seen it happen in the last months and years. I've seen you bring people to Jesus who, who were on one side of the fence and now have jumped over the fence because of your power, because of, of you working in their hearts. You did it to me and you'll do it to others and help me have that faith. Help me to realize you are the greatest gift. The most wonderful gift. You're all I need. All I need is Jesus. Just give me some Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'd rather have Jesus than anything.